25 people came to say that nobody believed I was going. <laughs> and nobody believed at all. And uh, 11.36, I had about half a pint left. I was talking to my dad. And then I realized, man, I've got one more minute in my old life. So I finished my pint. I stood up. I said, to everybody, guys, I really, really appreciate the fact you came. But now it's time for me to make my journey. And I walked out of the pub, passed down, down to the village. And I literally walked out of my life and started again completely fresh. And it was the most liberating <laughs> thing I've ever done. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Chat with Nomads. I'm really looking forward to the conversation today because we have with us a very comical character. <laughs> we are the founder of Total Croatian News, the drinker of gazillion beers, and the creator of the self-proclaimed best Manchester curry, Paul Bradbury. Hi Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you, that was a lovely introduction, uh, but it really is the best Manchester curry. But anyway, go on. <laughs> nice to be here, thanks for asking me. Well, I've tried it and, and it's pretty decent. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. But it was a really nice lunch that we had. Um, so very excited to dive into this. But before we start, I want to set the stage kind of for the audience a bit. Um, so when I first landed in Croatia as uh, the Digital Nomad Ambassador, I already had this plan to create a special series that speaks to the brains behind people that are pushing the initiative for Croatia to become a digital nomad destination, right? So Total Croatia News is obviously one of the bigger players and significant players in the space. And I always knew I wanted to talk to you about that. But as I interact more with you and got to know you, I realized I'll be letting down my travel fanatic listeners if I didn't have you to come on to talk about your travel stories because everyone knows you as the, the journalist at Total Creation News, but when you were younger, you're actually a very avid traveler with some really insane stories. So yeah. today I, 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 I had a life, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. So today I definitely want to talk to you a bit about the lost elements of travel because travel has evolved like, you know, so drastically throughout the years, right? And yeah. we have had like speakers like Nora Dunn, the founder of Professional Hobo and people like Carlos Moreno, who yeah. travel like all the countries in the world and they started traveling like 20, 20 plus years ago and you were there then yeah. and then some. So you were even like more prehistoric, if you could put it that way, where my documentation yeah. of anything of your travel yeah. journey was like not easy, right? So yeah. I would love to talk to you about that. And for yeah. the listeners, we might split this into two different videos, uh, one focusing on the travel and another one just for the special series. So... I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm going to cut it or how I'm going to cut it, but if you want to follow up with both, hit the subscribe button and then let's dive in. So Paul, why don't we start with you doing an introduction of yourself? I think that'll be interesting already. Uh, I'm, a, I, I'm a, a fat pink blogger who was born in the rain in Manchester um, and uh, ended up moving to the sunniest island in Croatia, Hwa, um, via Somaliland, where I was working as an aid worker. Uh, I've been living here for uh, 19 years now, and now currently in Zagreb. Um, I find living in Croatia and the Balkans in general addictive because it's that uh, it's that amazing combination of lifestyle with absurdity on a daily basis, and just this whole Balkan sort of mixer. In, in it. And it's it's honestly it's incredible. I can't get enough of it, and everybody thinks I'm nuts, but. Um, I, I love everything about Croatia, even the bureaucracy. I'm, I'm being sued by the National Tourist Board for 100,000 kuna, about 15,000 euros at the moment. And I'm loving it. I'm blogging about that. It's just great. So maybe I'm a bit weird. Um, but uh, And so before I came to Croatia, I never really had a career. I started, my first job was as a male chambermaid cleaning toilets in a four-star hotel in Munich. Um, and then I've had my own wine business with my father. I've been a humanitarian aid worker in uh, on the edge of Siberia, Georgia, Rwanda, after the genocide and in uh, Somalia. Um, and so I've done a, I was an English, French, German, and Russian teacher in Japan, in Hiroshima. Um, and then I, when I moved to Croatia, you know, I'd been to like 95 countries. I'd lived in, lived in 10. And then I bought this spontaneously, this house on this island, uh, on Hua, and uh, I met a girl in the library. And uh, 19 years later, with two lovely children, uh, well, almost lovely teenage girls. And, um, and, and, and I find myself, uh, I started writing a blog about the island 10 years ago, and uh, it became really quite successful. And we brought the New York Times to, to the island and Sunday Times. And, and then I expanded to other things. And then I ended up uh, in 2015, realizing that Croatia didn't have a national 
news portal in English. So I, I had no idea about anything about Croatia, politics, anything. I, I actually managed to interview the president of the country without knowing which political party he was. And that, that's how good I was. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so Total Croatia News started and um, it's been what the, an incredible journey of uh, fun and uh, discovery and uh, of the people I've met, the stories we've done, it's just been insane. Um, so yeah, and now I live in Zagreb and um, I just I just love it, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a very happy guy, I have to say. And I would say, <laughs> I, I, I would just say, you know, come to Croatia because it's just nuts. It really is nuts. <laughs> it's a great place for a holiday, but it's insane for actual living. Awesome, awesome. Just based on the introduction, I already have like a series of questions okay. from all the way from the start to like your current current status, right? Um, okay. Let's start from the beginning because I've heard parts of your story, but definitely I didn't have the full timeline of everything, right? So what, when did you first start traveling? When was your very first trip? Uh, outside of my, 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 I mean, the, the earliest traveling memory I've got is at the age of six with my brother, uh, taking a flight to Ireland to go, to go visit my uncle. And we went without our parents. And, and that's my very, very first sort of memory um, of that. But I guess the first big trip I did was, um, and this probably set the tone for the rest of my life, really, because it was a bit random. Um, I uh, I was working cleaning toilets in a four-star hotel in Munich. Um, I did that for eight months, actually. I cleaned 2,710 toilets in my career. <laughs> very, 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 very tough job. And I saved enough money to, I dropped out of university and I saved up enough money from my toilet cleaning to buy a one-way ticket to Caracas in Venezuela. And my idea was that I was going to find myself um, mm, in South America. Okay. And this was in 1989, so before you were born, probably. And uh, just just and right after I was born. <laughs> just right after you were born, yeah. Okay, right. There we go. Makes me feel. That's, that's just, the, the problem with these digital nomads is they're all so bloody young, you know. And I'm there, and I'm like, <laughs> God. Um, <laughs> and uh, the idea was that I had a, another toilet cleaning friend uh, who also wanted to travel, but uh, we were going to go and travel at different times. I was going to Guyana, uh, Georgetown, Guyana, where I had a school friend going to stay with him for two months. And then my friend was going to come later. And we agreed that we would meet on October the 1st at one o'clock outside the opera house in Manaus in the middle of the Amazon. Okay. Yes. And we'd wait, we'd wait for an hour. And if the person didn't turn up that day, we'd come back for four days. And if after four days they weren't coming, then uh, you know they weren't coming and then you were on your own in the heart of the Amazon. Okay, and this hang was on. Before... For, the, for, the, for the younger listeners, right, we, we need to we need to remind okay. them that back then telephones and internet did not exist. Oh yeah, okay. So yeah, so so so, so th there was no such thing as email. Uh, there was no social media. There were no mobile phones. Um, the only communication <laughs> was by postcard. <laughs> so he, he, this guy, he sent me, he sent me a postcard, and it took about a month to arrive. And he's like, "You're just confirming you will be there," because I'm a bit nervous that you won't be there. Because I'm, you know, and it was, and 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 back then they had a thing called, uh, maybe they still do, uh, uh, travelers checks. Do they still exist? I don't know. Have you, have you ever heard of I travelers checks? I think they still exist, but no one uses yeah. them anymore. Okay, so American Express had this amazing service where you could buy your travelers checks, and you go around. And if you had American dollar, uh, American Express travelers checks, you could use their offices as a post office. So people could send mail to American Express, Paul Bradbury, American Express, uh, Rio de Janeiro, and it would get there. Ooh. So, uh, yeah, and this was the only how, way. So how long does it generally take, though? Like, if you do it this way? About three weeks. It took about three weeks. <laughs> but, you know, so, so literally, I... I um, you know, when I got to Rio at the end of the trip, I was like, uh, you know, there was like 17 letters waiting from me, you know, like, like, like the bank manager's cut, cutting off my account and then you know, the, I've been accepted to university and then this person's died and, and, and that was the only way. So um, so I went to Manaus and I got there at one o'clock on, and I was 19. I, I'd never really traveled properly before and I hadn't, no, I didn't speak any Spanish or Portuguese. I didn't really know anything about South America because we're going to do it together, you know, and um, and I got there, and it's beautiful. It's a rubber opera house. It's amazing, amazing construction. And I'm, I'm in the middle of the Amazon. I'm waiting for my friend, and uh, two o'clock comes, and he's not there. And then uh, next day, not there. And after day four at two o'clock, I realised, fuck, I'm literally 
alone in the middle of the Amazon and I have no idea what to do next. I mean, no idea, you know, I had no social skills or anything. And um, I had $2,700 in traveler's checks and no return ticket back to the UK. Uh And I was like, and then I met this uh, French guy. Uh, He was a, he was a shrimp farmer in um, French Guyana. And he said, uh, oh, he said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm traveling. And he says, uh, and I said, well, where are you going next? And he says, uh, oh, I'm going to Riberalta. I said, oh, so am I. Maybe we can go on the same bus together. You know? I'd never even heard of Riberalta. I was just, he was the only connection I had to anything. right? And so we went to Riberalta, which was a border town with Bolivia and, um, and, uh, and, and Brazil. And uh, we, we played chess. He had a chess set. We played a lot of chess. And then uh, I asked him, like, like uh, where's he going next? He says, oh, well, obviously La Paz. And I was like, oh, yeah, me too. You know? And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and said, you're just tagging along, basically. Uh, yeah, because literally he was the only thing I had in the world that sort of how, I could how hold How old was to. the guy, though? How old was the French dude? He was in the 30s, I think, yeah. So he was, oh, I mean, right, he, right. He, was he, he knew what he was doing, right? And then he said to me, how are you getting to La Paz? I said, oh, well, I haven't quite worked it out yet. And he said, you know that there is no road officially. And I was like, no. And he says, well, so the only way to get there is they have these trucks from this Brazil nut factory. And uh, you can buy a place on top of the Brazil nuts, mm. on top of the truck for $25. It'll take three days. And I was like, um, fuck. okay i'll do that and um you know literally it took six days because the truck fellow got stuck in the river and then you know we had to wait a day for that and stuff and um and it was just amazing I mean, the views are incredible but things i'm really terrified of heights okay now when you go up into the andes you uh, you have this mountain thing like this and this mountain right. thing like this and and all these crosses where people have died and they've been you know and then you've got the truck okay and i'm sat on top of this thing holding on to nothing but it's just brazil nuts and it's like this and then you know I'm, i can't look down there because i'm really terrified of heights but yeah. then you look ahead and you see the mountain and then you see uh, you know just nothing like a drop off and then, <laughs> but when the truck goes around the corner you're just going straight into nothing. It was the most frightening thing of my life, honestly. <laughs> and it was basically uh, it was six months of six months of travel like that where I got completely lost. And uh, and, and I, I actually spoke to hardly anybody because I was so shy. Um, and uh, I remember I went to there was an island called Chiloé, which is uh, which is uh, yeah. in southern Chile. Yeah. And yeah. so I went there and I thought. I'm going to learn Spanish. So I bought a Spanish book to teach myself Spanish. And, uh, and it's a beautiful place. And I, I, I didn't know where to stay or anything. So I had my tent. So I, I just put it in this field. right? And I, I was in my shorts and T-shirt. And I went for a walk just to have a look around. And, and it started raining really, really hard. So I was running back to my tent. I was absolutely soaked. Thinking, I've got to get into my tent. And then my tent wasn't there anymore. Um, and <laughs> You got blown off? No, standing, standing where my tent used to be, there were four cows and they were, and they just flattened my tent <laughs> and they just crapped all over it. Right. So it was just I like mean, this tent. I mean, I can't imagine because I was in Chiloe uh, a couple of years ago and yeah. Chiloe is still considered pretty like village vibe in, in some sense when you go there. Yeah, today, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And you're talking about like 30, 30 plus years ago, that Chiloe, yeah. I'm thinking like, that's probably pretty basic. It was, it was, yeah, it was totally basic. Yeah. 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 So yeah, so that was my first. I mean, and lots of things happened and stuff, and then uh, I ended up coming back to um, back to the UK after six months, and went back to cleaning toilets in Munich, and so my life began. <laughs> so, so it was six months in this in South America, and which countries did you ultimately cover? Because you were obviously just uh, so I spent I spent two months I spent two months in Guyana which was uh, with a school friend. And that was amazing because I had a, a like a, a host and we flew around the country and we went into the outback on the Brazilian border to a ranch and stuff. And so, uh, and that was really, really, really um, comfortable and fantastic. And then I went uh, on the through Rio Baral, to La Paz. I went into um, like a sort of a lot of Bolivia. And then I went into um, uh, Northern Chile. Uh, so there's an amazing oasis village in the Atacama Desert called San Pedro de Atacama. And it's just mm-hmm. desert all around. And, it's, and I was there for about, and there's geezers and everything. And it was just, it was an amazing place to go. And then, um, and then I thought, well, what am I going to do? So I thought I'll hitchhike. 
So I, because there's no buses or anything, so I, so I just got on the road and I, you know, in the desert and stuck my thumb out and seen what will happen next. And this truck stopped, and uh, he drove me 1,700 miles uh, non-stop to uh, Santiago. So, ah, okay. So then I, I did, can't um, believe hitchhiking was a thing back then. Yeah, I thought it was a very hitchh- hitchhiking was a huge. It was much bigger before than it is now. Much bigger. Really, in South America, no. that's uh, yeah, that's m- interesting. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I hitched, I hitched a lot in South America. Yeah. And I mean, obviously stupid, but, but yeah. Uh, and then I went across the uh, Lake District into uh, San Carlo, uh, Carlos de Bariloche, um, and then up to Buenos Aires, where I got mugged or attempted mugged. And then uh, I was in Paraguay, went to Uruguay, and uh, then into uh, in, back to Brazil, down to Rio. Um, and then, uh, yeah, had my my moment of getting my flight home, which was an interesting story. But... <laughs> I think I think we'll get to that because I think I've heard part of that story and it's it's pretty interesting. But okay. going back to the start, at nineteen, wait, at the start, why did you even go to Munich in the first place to work? Like I'm sure UK had like pretty good opportunities. Why was it? Why was there a consideration to go to Munich to wash toilets I'm, in a hotel? I'm, um, I'm I'm a bit embarrassed to admit this, but because because you wore your special yellow spectacles for me, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> So the previous summer, I was uh, interrailing. You know this 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 one one month train pass, which I think they still have for under twenty sixes. Yeah. And uh, we went to Munich and we stayed at this campsite, and the energy was amazing. All these drunk Irish students that were working at BMW factory, and they were earning an incredible amount of money, like seven euros fifty an hour, which was insanely big money back in the thirteenth century. And and. Um, and then I dropped out of university and I said to my friends, you know, he also dropped out. Why don't we go to Munich and earn loads of money working in BMW and, uh, you know, and then just see where it goes. So um, he said, okay, so we, uh, I forgot, God, now if I tell you the whole story. So then we, yeah, we, we, we had this really bad hitch from, uh, from London to Dover. And then we got the ferry to Ostend for, for midnight. And we'd been hitchhiking all day. My friend was really up. He was like, this is terrible. You know, let's have a drink. Let's play. It. So he bought, he asked me what my favorite alcohol or spirit was. And I said, vodka. And he said, oh, mine's whiskey. I said, okay. And he bought a pack of cards. And uh, he, um, he was uh, playing this game, explaining it. And he said, if you lose, you have to drink two fingers of your bottle. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, and, and then, and I lost the first one, so I had to drink two two fingers of vodka straight down. And then he said, "And every time you lose, I can introduce another rule, such as you can no longer mention numbers." And I was like, "Okay." And then and then uh, then and then he said to me, "What time does the ferry get in?" And I said, "About four o'clock." He said, "Ah, two more fingers." You know. Long story <laughs> short, I apparently finished the whole liter in twenty minutes. Um, <laughs> so I, that's I, I, where you I, get your superpower today with. <laughs> well, I woke, I, woke, I woke up the next morning um, and I couldn't move my legs. And I was okay. like, I was like, I just literally couldn't move my legs. And I was terror. I'm like, where the hell am I? And I didn't even remember leaving the ferry or finishing the bottle, you know. So, and, um, and then it was this pain in my arm. And there was, and I was like, what the fuck happened, you know? And I'm, I'm in my, uh, Boxer shorts only. That's it. I've got so somebody's taken all my clothes off, or I have, or something. And I'm like, and then I'm like, so I, I, I really panicking. Look down, and uh, my my legs are strapped to this bed, physically strapped to this bed, right? And I'm oh like, gosh. what the fuck? <laughs> and then my um, and then there's a big tube coming out of my arm uh, up to this um, uh, you know, uh, liquid and stuff. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, and apparently what happened was I got yeah I got arrested coming off the ferry because I, I didn't want to leave the ferry because I was tired and then um, and then uh, you know, they they sent me to the hospital and everything and so, anyway um, oh so, then, uh, so then so uh, then and my friend came the next day and he was great and he said come on Paul we need to get out just get to the motorway it's only five hundred meters away from the hospital and I'll do the hitchhiking and everything I said okay wait, no problem and. Um, so I got out of the hospital finally, and then the first thing I did was vomit everywhere. I mean, I was in a really, really bad condition. And then we got to the um, motorway, and I'm standing, at, I'm lying at the side, and he's like, "I'll, I'll hitchhike. You just lie there; nobody will see you. Then I'll, I'll get you." 
And I felt really, really uh, thirsty. And there was a petrol station about 200 meters away. So I walked towards it to get some water. I vomited on the way there. I got some water. I vomited on the way back. And when I got back, all that was there was a green rucksack. And my friend had gone. What, he left and you? We had, a, we had this agreement that it's always going to be easier to hitchhike just one, uh, one person than two people. You can have more chance to lift. And so That's if we had the opportunity... Much. <laughs> and and oh he'd gone, but, but he'd gone with all the money. I, I didn't, I, I, I think I had like three Deutschmarks or something with me. Um, and, but I had the tent. Okay. So I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, I mean, I'm in Northern Belgium um, with no money and vomiting everywhere. So I managed to hitchhike to the German border and I just put up my tent in a truck park, all these trucks, like, and, and I slept for 13 hours. You know, I was, I mean, I was physically, I was just dead after this thing. And then the first car I approached at the petrol station there was a, an amazing professor from the University of Hull who couldn't believe my story, drove me right into central Munich, bought me lunch on the way and gave me 60 Deutschmarks and said, look after yourself. Um, I mean, one of the most amazing things that ever happened to me, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. Do you ever get yeah. in touch with him again? Uh, with, with the professor or with my friend that left me? With, uh, with, actually, with both now that you asked. I was asking yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm good. I'm, I'm, he lives in Australia now. We haven't seen each other for 25 years and stuff. But yeah, he's, uh, we, we, we talk occasionally. And the professor, no, I, I lost contact. But um, anyway, so finally we got to Munich and my friend was there, you know, we're there. It was good. And then we went to BMW to start our amazing career. And they said, we're not hiring. <laughs> so, so then again, this is also back then, there was no way to know, like today is easy, right? You go on LinkedIn or you go on like some job portal yeah, yeah. and figure out if no, there's no, a position. No, no. Yeah, I mean, I guess, no, you'd, you'd send a letter or you'd, uh, or, I mean, I, I mean, no, you could make a phone call, you know, a landline phone call, but in terms of mobiles and that stuff, no. We just assumed the jobs would be there. And so, uh, and then we, we went to the British consulate and said like, uh, we had this brilliant plan and BMW's <laughs> not hiring. Do, do you have any suggestions? And they said, Hotel Sheraton is hiring, um, Chambermaids. So we became, I became a chambermaid. And I was good. <laughs> okay, so that's already crazy because like a lot of things, when, what you guys did, obviously the lack of technology was created some yeah. of those, but also sounds like it was a bit of a reckless act that you guys were doing to just go without any confirmation yeah. or clarification. My, my, my kids are like, how are you still alive? You know, they... they <laughs> And they're just like, you know, you, it's just, you know, the stuff you did. And I, I, yeah, it just happens, you know. Um, but then, uh, but talking about technology was really interesting because uh, I went to this uh, Zagreb ambassador evening that Dean Kuchel, the, uh, the, uh, the Israeli legend, um, uh, did. And he was talking about his travels, 100 countries in seven years and this and this and this. And, I'm, and he's got community everywhere he goes. And this is all, you know, and, it, and I was listening to him. I'm going, this is all fantastic. And it's great. And I... You know, I'm 52 now, and um, I've had a really interesting time in life and so on. And I love hanging out with Dean and the energy. But after two days, I'm dead, man. I just, I just can't do it. You know, and all this connect, 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 put, put, it's just, it blows my mind. But then I said to him, I'd like, I'd like to speak at this because I have a very different perspective uh, on travel. Um, so 20 years ago, 2000 and 2001 um like a few months before i was married before to uh to a girl who was um half english half Col colombian and uh totally nuts and uh after one year of marriage she she ran off with a hairy truck driver and um and i was in pieces and i was drinking the pub and my life was over and everything and i was like 30 or something and you know the, the hairy truck driver and it was just and uh, so um, one evening, a friend of mine said, you know, what are you going to do with your life? You can't keep doing this. You'll literally drink yourself to death. And I said, uh, you know what? I'm going to hitchhike to South Africa. And he, the whole pub just laughed at me. And I was just like, and he went to the toilet. And, then, and when he went to the toilet, I thought, why the hell not? Okay, so um, when he came back, he said, seriously, what are you going to do? And I said, you know what? I'm going to do that. Uh, today is uh, November the 24th, um, three months from today on uh, the 24th of February, 2001. I'm going to come to this pub when it opens at 11 o'clock. I'm going to have two beers and at exactly 
I'm going to stand up. I'm going to walk out with my half size rucksack. Just I'll take an eight kilo rucksack. Um, I'm going to walk past my house, past the place they are, past the place da, 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 out of the village, five kilometers down to the motorway and have a little sign saying South Africa and start hitchhiking. And everybody laughed. And uh, 11 o'clock on February the 24th, 2001, I came to the pub and at 11.36, so 25 people came to say that nobody believed I was going. <laughs> and nobody believed it at all. And uh, I, uh, 11.36, I had about half a pint left. I was talking to my dad and then I realized, man, I've got one more minute in my old life. So I finished my pint. I stood up. I said to every guys, I really, really appreciate the fact you came, but now it's time for me to make my journey. And I walked out of the pub, passed down, down to the village, I literally walked out of my life and started again completely fresh. And it was the most liberating thing I've ever done. I, I love this because like from all your stories, I'm hearing a lot of things about certain elements that continue to exist today in travel. Um, like for example, you were saying meeting people who will help you along the way, the yeah. concept of hitchhiking, the reason of why you decide to take a long journey, right? Even today, there are people who take a journey because they think they are going to use that to find themselves or to yeah, renew yeah. life, right? And on the other yeah. hand, you also mentioned certain elements that, that are totally not, non -ex non-existent in the past, uh, talking about like technology and connecting with people yeah. and stuff, right? So before we get into the next story, I definitely want to hear from you. What do you think are the elements of travel that has been lost? I mean, you have interacted with a lot of nomads, I'm pretty sure. Right. Yeah, uh, it's it, 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 it's a good question. And and talking when Dean was talking, you know, I'm just I, I listened to him, and, and he's a fascinating guy, and I I love his lifestyle. I love him, and I just thought, wow. Let me just compare what you're doing now with the technology you have now to what I did tw just just twenty years ago. You know, mm -hmm, I mean, just mm -hmm. twenty years ago. And so I didn't take a camera with me on this. I, I was on the road for nine months. Right, I didn't take a camera. I didn't take uh, a phone. Um, Google was three years old. <laughs> Google was nothing, right? Yeah. Facebook didn't exist. Instagram didn't exist. WordPress didn't exist. LinkedIn didn't exist. There was no community, anything else at all. Uh, the only source of a place to connect with travelers uh, and the only thing was the Lonely Planet Thorn Tree, it's called. I don't think it's there anymore. And this was a, an amazing forum, which was done by regions. So, you know, you'd go to the Middle East, then you'd have questions on Syria. And, and, and So if you wanted to know about getting a, um, getting what's the latest on the visa situation to enter Syria, then uh, this was the only place you could get accurate information from people traveling. A bit like D D Discord communities today, I suppose. It was a very, very similar thing uh, to that. Mm -hmm. And that was it. There was nothing. And so, um, so when I was in my three months preparation point, I was on this thing a lot and I was connecting with travelers and stuff like that. And I was getting the information. It was, uh, it was really, really, really um, good. And I guess that was my first experience of community looking back at it. Uh, was that right? Um, and, um, but you know what? So I didn't take any, uh, and, and what I did was I, um, because I was a humanitarian aid worker before I worked in like Rwanda and, and Tbilisi and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and Russia, is I just connected with all my old aid worker friends. And I said, guys, uh, I've not been in touch for five years because I met a girl and now she's run off with a hairy truck driver. And uh, so um, I'm going to do this trip and I want to go to S South Africa through the Balkans, through the Caucasus, through the Middle East, through East Africa, all the way down. And uh, I'm really sorry I've not been in touch, but uh, if anybody wants to, uh, is not in any of these countries or you know somebody or anything else, and um, the response was just absolutely humbling. You know, people, man, where the hell have you been? You know, and then, and then there's a girl I quite fancied in Tajikistan in 1994. She was now working in Albania. We ended up traveling together for two weeks um, through through the Balkans, and that was definitely a highlight. Um, you know, and there was a guy I knew from uh, somewhere, and he was in Eritrea, and uh, and so, and then the most amazing thing happened uh, that. Um, uh, I 
got i had this website i had this email address because now we had email we had email in, in 2001 <laughs> we so we've, we've progressed now uh and i had this email address called uh ginger because i used to have i used to have hair i used to have ginger hair as well um so my uh my email address was, uh, ginger does africa at hotmail.com that was my uh, <laughs> that was my thing and so i wrote uh um an email to all my friends when i got to sarajevo uh, when i got to vienna um just about what had happened on the trip, so I wanted to thank them and everything else. And 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 I said, "It's this is the ginger report from uh, from from Vienna and stuff." And people are, "This is this is amazing stuff. Please please keep writing this as you travel." And I was like, "Really?" And you know, because I've never been a writer at all. You know, that, and and uh, and so I uh, I said, "Okay." So when I got to Sarajevo, um, I just um, I did the same thing, and it was like, "Man, this is amazing." And then people were contacting me saying, "I'm a friend of so and so. Please put me on your uh, subscriber list." Okay, mm. so people, people I'd never even heard of, you know, and um, so it was, which is a really sort of um, an ego boost kind of thing. And then what happened was. Uh, I would write about the people I stayed with. A lot of people that hosted me, like aid worker friends or friends, or they'd say, oh, Paul's coming through, he's this. And this is his report from the last place. It's really, really interesting. And uh, and they'd say, oh, come and stay with us. And then they'd think, my God, he's going to write about us. So they would treat me like a king. And I'd have the, I'd have the best local experiences. And I'd write about it. And I, you know, I'd be grateful. And, and, it just, and, and it just went on. And I stayed with a Lebanese architect in Western Kosovo. I, uh, I Then when I was in Beirut, uh, a friend of her friend, uh, met me there you know I, uh, some people I knew were friends but most of them were friends of friends and it just rolled it was just it was you know it just it was just incredible and uh I didn't I didn't hitchhike the whole way obviously and then and, and in fact I had to take a couple of planes uh because of uh, visa situations and stuff and and actually, I was in a plane crash actually we a Boeing 727 uh, landed in uh, Eritrea and missed, missed, missed the runway and so that was quite interesting you know so are you um, on that plane yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, oh, Yemenia. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's funny because you know you we, we sort of w w when you come into land you you have you have you have the uh, you see that you have that's the air, that's the air, the airstrip and the, the plane will come in like this right and this one came in like this like oh, halfway so down at a and, very and, sharp and, angle that is like insane and then we <laughs> we literally bounced and there was one other white guy on the plane a Danish guy next to me and we looked at each other going and the thing wasn't slowing down. And then finally, it, it left the runway, and uh, it came to rest about fifty meters on its side, like this. And the wing had snapped. Right? Dang. And I'm sitting there going, "Fuck!" <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and everyone's just there. And then everyone's just like laughing and just li literally. And the, the oxygen masks do come down automatically, by the way. And uh, and the, um, the they were going to the compartment to get their to get their stuff, and so they're just. Regular landing, and then somebody said in Tigrinian, the uh, like the local language, that said like uh, benzene, and I was like, I'm like, and then there was this emergency thing just to get everyone down the chute and, and run away from the plane, and um, it did it didn't blow up, but so yeah, that, and that was my, and then I got to immigration, and they said, where's your visa? I said, uh, I don't need one. I said, yes, you do. I said, well, I don't have one, uh, and if you want to deport me on that plane, good luck. <laughs> so I, I ended up paying, I ended up paying a like, fifty dollar bribe, I think, to get to get in and stuff. And, uh, so yeah, anyway, oh, so so God. at the end. So at the end of the trip, I had all these reports, and I had like 500 people on my mailing list, um, most of whom I didn't know. And um, and it, and so when I came back, somebody said, "Why don't you turn this into a book?" Okay, and I thought actually the content's all there, and I hadn't ever, um, you know, I've been to countries that even I'd never heard of before I started the trip, you know. So mm -hmm. and and this was like 20 years ago. The world was a different place in terms of travel, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, I feel really privileged to have you know done those two trips in south america in 1989 and on this this thing in 2001 and um and so eventually i did I, I i turned it into a book and um the first line of the book was uh so what would you do if your wife ran off with a hairy truck driver <laughs> and that's the first uh, and the, the book is called lebanese nuns don't ski um, which is a strange title, uh, but the, and it, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's on Kindle and it's on Amazon, um, and uh, it's a self-published thing. Um, and uh, the reason I called it that was I found myself in the Syrian desert uh, on this trip, uh, hiking with six Lebanese nuns. I can't even remember why, but I was alone with six Lebanese nuns hiking through some place, and, and uh, there was a really cute nun, about 28 years old, uh, Jocelyn's name was, and... Uh, 
we're sort of talking and she says, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm like, I'm kind of like, I'm just curious, like, how did you find God? And, you know, because you're gorgeous and, you know, Western. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm nothing against religion, but you're just like, it's just a bit unusual. You know, I used to be a marketing consultant for Smith Klein Beecham, banging my, my boyfriend, was drunk every night, going skiing every weekend, everything else. And then I just found God and I was like, okay. And then, uh, and I said, what do you miss most about your former life? And she said, skiing. And I said, skiing? She goes, yeah, well, we're not allowed to ski. And I just thought, that is a brilliant title for a book. So I'm going to call it Lebanese Nuns Don't Ski. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it only covers one story of like all your experiences across different places, obviously. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a story of the trip, yeah. And then, and then the best <laughs> bit about it is the conclusion, because I, I had nine months that changed my life. I mean, it changed everything changed in my 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 perspective i saw amazing stuff i learned i learned to deal with pain uh mm -hmm. because the pain i saw on the trip you know it was just i mean we went to some really really i, I met an afghan refugee um in uh, southern iran who stopped me on the street showed me around and then i bought him dinner and then he said, come to my house for lunch tomorrow. So I went into the suburbs, like where all the Af Afghan refugees were, and I was playing chess with him there and hearing all his story. And eventually he decided to uh, do the the uh, migrant routes to the UK. And uh, he asked me for some help. And I was like, well, who am I to not to help somebody just because I happen to be born in the West and I'm traveling and he's trying to get a better life for his kids. Uh, so he stayed actually with a couple of my friends on the way, one in Vienna. Um, and you know, I, I said to George, I've got this, it's a weird request. He's an Afghan migrant. Um, he's really nice. He's desperately looking for help. Would you put him up for a night? And I will vouch for him. And if he steals anything, I'll give you all the money. He won't steal. He's a really good guy. And he's like, whoa, that's a big request. And I'm like, trust me. And he's like, I do trust you. He stayed. They had an amazing time. And then uh, when I was in Rwanda on this trip, he sent me an email, this Afghan uh, Tahir and then was saying, Paul, I really need help. I'm in Bulgaria. I'm out of money. I need $300. Is there anything you can do? And I was, I was just like, so I, I sent him the money. You know? And I'm like, you know, give it me back sometime or don't, but just do well. And then about two months later, he sent me an email and he said, um, um, Greetings from Winchester, which is a, a town in um, in uh, UK. He'd made it and stuff. Mm, and yep. uh, his story was incredible. Uh, with, and it's in the book, actually. Um, and um, and then he got a, an apartment in London, and I went to see him. And I was his first ever guest. Uh, oh, so he's doing well now after the He's doing fine, yeah. And then his family's all over, and he's working hard and everything else. You know? But I was his first ever guest, and it, it meant so much to him that you know mm -hmm. somebody who'd helped him and, and this was all from you know meeting a random meeting in southern iran and then again with chess and everything else and it was uh i mean we've lost contact now but it was an amazing friendship because it was so two traveling journeys of very different um you know quality and and and, and purpose and stuff and it came together so so yeah, yeah so but so at the end of the trip um it was li literally life-changing and uh i came back nine months later into the pub where it all started and I walked into the bar and Sarah, who was this amazing hot um, waitress, uh, she was there. She looked at me with a huge smile. She put her hand on the beer pump and she just looked at me and said, the usual. <laughs> as though as though nothing had changed. Nothing happened. <laughs> and you, you know what? Nothing had changed in that pub, right? right? And I was just like, whoa, I need to get out of here. And so um, on that journey... I was staying in uh, Nairobi, in Kenya, uh, with uh, some friends of mine when I was an aid worker in Rwanda in, after the mm -hmm. genocide in '94. And uh, they said, what are you going to do now? And I said, I, I really don't know. Um, and they said, well, there's a job in Somali, Smart Somalia, Northern Somalia. Um, and I was like, Northern Somalia? I mean, I'll be dead in a week, you know? And they said, no, 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 like, you know, if you want it. So I, ah. so I applied for it and I got it. And so then after this trip, I, I came back and I flew to Nairobi and then I went to live in... Uh, Somaliland and uh, eastern Somalia, where, where all the pirates are. And so in, in Puntland, which is the eastern bit, um, I wasn't allowed out of the compound without an armed guard. Wow. And my armed guard, it was to kidnap uh, pink people or white people. And, um, 
And so <laughs> literally I was in the compound and that was it. And then I went out, I had, an aunt, I had a guy with a Kalashnikov, his name was uh, Arafat. And he actually had a kefir, a bit like uh, Yasser Arafat and stuff. And um, yeah, it was wild. And I went to places there that I, you know, that I've never seen white people before, you know. And uh, I think my, my, my best memory of that was um, we went to this really remote village where it hadn't rained for three years. Okay. And I had this big red hair. Okay. And, uh, and uh, I'm fr- you know, from Manchester. Okay. And uh, they haven't seen a white person before. And I came out of the car and literally three seconds later, the first drop of rain came out of the sky. And then it just started raining for the first time in three years. And they, no, no, <laughs> you, you have to wait for the, the end of the story is 25 times better than this. And so they're all getting their buckets and there were anything else. And then, and then uh, after the trip, I was, please come back next week, you know, like rain God from Manchester. Okay. So that's a cool story. But then fast forward, uh, how much was it? Two years, two years. Uh, I'm living in Croatia on the island of Khwar in Yelsa. And I started a real estate business selling property to foreigners on, on, in Croatia. Uh-huh. And uh, this English guy, Mark, who became my best friend, um, we, we, he lived on the island for nine years, uh, came with this amazingly, stunningly beautiful girlfriend who was half Somali and half Welsh. Right? So her, her mum was Somali and her dad was an aid worker who was from Wales. So we're talking and, you know, and, and then I'm saying, oh, I've been to your country. She goes, what? Nobody's ever been to Somalia and come back alive. You know, like, what, what, what's the story? And so I told her the story. And then I told her this story about the rain. And she's like is it really true? And I said, is what really true? Was, really happened? That, that fiery guy from Manchester with the red hair? And I'm like, well, yeah. And uh, how do you know? And she, My mother is a warlord in one of the villages um, around there. And we heard this, this urban myth story of this like, guy came one day and he just brought the rain. Of it. <laughs> Insane. Yeah, true story. Yeah. Oh my God, that's, that's crazy. But hearing your stories, right? Because I, w- I was going to ask, like, what was, the, what was the trigger to leave Munich for traveling at the age of 19? Because I'm, I'm assuming back then, obviously, traveling was not the typical hype that it is today because it was now it's easy and kind of cheap to do it because there are like budget airlines, good infrastructure. But back then, it's yeah. going to be difficult, right? So yeah. but hearing from it, it seems that you were drawn inherently to just crazy experiences. Well, I'm not drawn to it. I've, I've never been one for planning anything. Um, and it's caused me problems in life. And I've just, I'm very much go with the flow. And, um, and because of that, I've never had a career. Uh, I mean, and then, you know, when I moved to Croatia, I, I did, I was a real estate agent. I was um, importing this technology. I was doing, you know, lots of different things. Um, but since I came to Croatia, I've really stabilized. You know, my, my, my wife really sort of calmed me down. And you know, having a family has been great. And, and I, love, I love the stability now. And I wouldn't want to go back to that life. Um, but when I was an aid worker, um, it's just the adrenaline. You know? I mean, mm-hmm. Rwanda was, uh, was just one big head fuck. I mean, I, 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 I lived with uh, a Rwandese girl, Rose, and an American boyfriend, who's my boss. She lost half of a more than half of her family in the genocide, and uh, you know, and everybody around had lost almost everybody, and it was just, you know, and um, it's funny because I actually went uh, for therapy for the first time in my life three weeks ago, mm. and I just talked about uh, I just wanted to talk to some issues and uh, just. And I had this, um, I, talk, I told the, the story about the truck driver as the first one. I said, this is kind of a trauma and this is how I dealt with it. And everything was fine. And then I was in the pub afterwards having a beer, just thinking about, and I was totally fine. And then suddenly this train came from nowhere through my head. And it was a throwback to Kigali 1994 and all these unfinished issues that I have there. And I was crying in the pub. I, was, I didn't sleep for a week. Um, and I was just trying to deal with these demons. And eventually I realized that I need to go and see four people mm-hmm. that I worked with in 1994 that I haven't seen for 20 odd years. And I need to see them, give them a hug and that will give me the closure. And so I contacted them all and they're all like, man, it'd be so great to see you. And so one of them's in uh, New York city, two of them are in Portland, Oregon, and one of them's in uh, Bainbridge Island in Seattle. 
Uh, mm. So in April, I'm going to the States for the first time in 28 years just to hug four people. And, oh, wow. Uh, forward. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a fairly intense time, but it's good. I mean, I'm 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 feeling great actually. Yeah. That that's a very interesting thing because I I've never heard about this from from you before, and and hearing from like your travel story, obviously today's nomads travel like long periods of time, but your yeah. travel style back then was pretty much on the nomadic side versus the typical yeah. tourist traveler yeah. side of things, right? Yeah. And I'm just always wondering about this. There's always been this talk, obviously technology helped to improve everything. But yeah. throughout life, there are always people saying that, you know, now people are stuck to their phones, they're stuck to their yeah. laptops. And, yeah. then, you know, yeah. but back then, I imagine that without, it was partly because that there wasn't like the other things to do. Human connections were very real when you were traveling because Absolutely. that is yeah. your own so-called leisure, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah but now... <laughs> No, it's, it's funny, you know, again, listening to Dean and he's got his amazing photos and his community and, you know, I, I love what his, his philosophy is uh, or his, his saying is that he travels um, solo, but he never travels alone because mm-hmm. wherever he goes, he finds community or he knows the community is there. You know, and, and on the one level, that's great. But to me, it's no longer real. It's not traveling anymore. It's, it's something else, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm now fully plugged into Facebook and all that shit. And I post a lot of stuff and I'm, and then my my Facebook memories will tell me like three years ago, you went to this dinner here and I'm like, I don't really remember that actually, uh, or that experience or yeah, but I can take you through every single destination and every single experience and have a photograph in my head from my trip in South America in 1989 and my Lebanese and don't ski 20 years ago. I can tell you mm-hmm. exactly where I was, and I, I can have the mental images that. And for the last ten years, it's just a blur because right. we, you know because our brains have been re- retuned to it's on Facebook. So if it's not on Facebook, it didn't happen, you know. Whereas, uh, and everything I've got is internal. And my, I mean, I've traveled a lot. I've, I've had some amazing experiences. But if you ask me what were my best two travel experiences, it was those two when I didn't have a phone, didn't have a camera, didn't even have email, the first one of them. And it was real. And everything was, you know, there was no booking.com. You know, you mm-hmm. couldn't book accommodation in advance like that. You know, it just that's just, you just go up there and you kind of hope the thing would be open, you know, and and so on. So it was um so so part of the travel experience then was the real necessity of having to get from A to B and actually finding something that we can get food, whereas everything now is like, you know, trip advice, oh, this is this, 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 you know. So, uh, and Lonely Planet was king. They, were, they, were, they had a Lonely Planet on a shoestring, South American on a shoestring, and uh, everybody had it because that's all there was, you know. That, that is yeah. a very, very interesting point because, well, I'm a tech fan. Everyone knows that I come from a tech background, yeah. so obviously I love tech. But what you said just resonated on another level in the sense that, a lot of nomadic traveler, we know consciously that travel is a lot more about the people than about the destination. Yeah. So even though we know that, but what you mentioned was that the, the non-existence of technology actually still brings it to an even deeper level of just experiencing <laughs> travel. Because, and it's, because, it, because it's, it's so much more authentic because you have to actually interact to survive. Yes. Whereas now just everything's oh so, and this and this and, and uh, you know I mean I'll give you an example of, of how crazy uh, the world has gone in terms of travel um, and this is a three or four years ago I mean ten out of ten for the idea fantastic idea like zero out of ten for tourism experience on the island of Hua which is a very beautiful island it's one of the most beautiful islands in the world uh, it's connected by catamaran from Split like one hour. And uh, this guy started an Instagram, uh, two-hour Instagram tour of Hua, okay? So for 39 euros, you would come off the catamaran. He would pick you up. He would drive you to the top of the island for that photograph. He would dry, dry, drive you to the lavender field for that photograph. He would drive you to this winery for this particular photograph. You would go to the top of the uh, castle for that particular photograph. And you'd have like 10 Instagram spots. And two hours later, you're on the catamaran back to split, Far tick. I've done that island. Mm-hmm. You haven't mm-hmm. even scratched the beginning of the scratching of the surface, but uh, but for people these days, that is travel, and it's that's not travel. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think now we are going even deeper, and I have nothing against. I'm sure you have nothing against the typical tourists, 
but obviously no, at all. I, I'm, I'm I'm not I'm not ju- I'm not judging at all. Um, I'm just yeah. saying that you know. Um, and it, 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 what's really interesting too is that um, you know I was talking to Talia, my daughter, who you know, and um, she's 13, and she's actually lamenting the fact that she won't be able to have the experiences that I had 20 years mm. ago because everything's been so discovered and stuff, you know. And, uh, so um, it's but you know, but some some people need that community. And some people don't, and pe- people are very different. And I don't judge anybody. But what was really interesting for you, I, I get lots of messages because I run, you know, TCN and and uh, people know I I, I, I I post a lot on Facebook and stuff. And this one woman messaged me and said, I've been living in this town on the coast now for three months. I'm from America, on this Croatian island, for three months, and I haven't met anybody, and I don't know how to meet people. Can you help me? And I'm like, go home. <laughs> 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 you know and it's like and so and anyway so I, I you know I said there is an expat uh, coffee morning that happens once a week here so I go down there and then she sort of met people and, but I'm like what are you doing if you if you you know I, it's really strange to me when I when I travel on my own uh when I used to I hardly met anybody mm-hmm. I actually like my own company when I'm traveling and uh and stuff and so but p- people are different some people need you know constant attention and, and engagement and stuff but uh, I I Tra- travel is a very it's a very personal thing it's a very different thing to d- different people um and yep. uh i would say is it possible still to do undiscovered travel yes it's harder and harder but uh you know three months ago when i took steve to eastern croatia for those six days um i had the most phenomenal tour of discovery of my time in eight, 18 years in croatia i thought i knew croatia very well and the two of us were completely blown away by what we, what we saw there, you know. So there are still pockets, but um, everything now is about a bucket list. Tick, 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 tick. I think. Yeah, that that's true. Like even even going to Antarctica, and I was uh, so I've been on the cruise, right? And I was speaking to some of the the staff that that has been on this this itinerary for the last ten years, and they were saying how they have really seen the change, even at such a unpopulated destination that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the the effect that humans have on like nature and stuff it's yeah. it's just different right so yeah. these days it's even harder to to move at a fast pace and really discover you know yeah. the actual traveling right so there is a huge shift i think in the last 20 30 years about the concept of travel i think this is probably the biggest yeah. shift in that it has really gone from a discovery of people i would say to kind of a checklist kind of thing that you want to just visit certain places you know what you, you know what would be you know what'd be really interesting and actually this could even be a tv series would be to take someone like me not mean you know that, that has had those 1989 experiences and 2001 experiences with no technology and to take someone like you or dean and for us to put an itinerary and travel together with but by 2001 rules so no no camera no phone, <laughs> no Google, yeah, yeah, and see, and I, I bet, I bet that travel experience would still be insanely amazing today. But could you handle it? Yeah, you I actually do think that that's actually a really great concept because I, I do think that I mean, just thinking about myself, yeah, I do think that without the the technologies aid in this, there's going to be a lot of mental challenges that's going to cause yeah. like what we assume is going to be like a bit of anxiety on like oh no like yeah. and and that is like even Dean both Dean and I are pretty experienced travelers even in that case yeah. I think just suddenly removing this like convenience that we have built up upon in like the last 10 20 10 years of travel I'll say I think that's going to cause like a bit of a hassle but like, oh shit now I can't like like try certain stuff and and even today I have a bad habit and I know that is some people don't like it is that whenever I want to go to a restaurant I always look up at least the rating somehow on Google Maps or something I will never I'll almost never go below anything with a below a four star right and and some I've traveled with a girl how many stars saying, like how many stars with the Manchester curry <laughs> I'll say I'll say four plus. <laughs> Okay, it's, okay, it's tasty. That. Come on, like, it's, it's tasty curry. So, yeah, so, so, but like other travelers have been like, like telling me also that we are losing that experience of, you know, just based on your visual, walk on the streets, 
look at something, if it looks good, you know, just go and try it. Like, like back then, no one used to check anything like that. You know, you, you're literally, yeah. when you're traveling, you're just walking. Anything that looks nice, you just make the purchase. No, no, but but, but you, you've just said it. That's it. You see, because back in 1989, there was none of that. And the only way to have the experience was to trial and error. You go and have a good thing, you have a bad thing. And the, the great thing about travel for me back then was it was about the experience. And mm-hmm. if every day was perfect, it would get boring pretty quickly. Right. You know, but you know, but you know, being in a plane crash and then being denied entry with no visa, you know, is like, you know, it's not it's not something I would have chosen, but it's you know, and you know, all the hitchhiking I did and you know, I I, I waited hours uh in the rain uh at certain places, you know. But I would not have given up that for a quick ride because that was the whole combination. And I think today right. everyone's just wants everything, you know. Every ho- restaurant experience now, like you, or, that you're going to have, is going to be pretty cool or to amazing because you're not prepared to take the risk of just going somewhere and having a bad experience. And if you do have a bad experience, you'll appreciate the good experience even more next time. And I think uh, there's been a lot of sanitization, I suppose, of uh, mm-hmm. of the travel because it's been pre uh, pre judged for you. These are the places because of ratings or because of whatever social media promotion. These are the things you have to go and see. Whereas um, I mean, I, I went to some destinations and I, I missed missed the main attractions. I didn't know it existed. You know, you know, yeah. I'd, I'd come through and you know, the, the, let's say that there's the Eiffel Tower, and I'd completely, you know, I'd go to Paris and not see it. And, and then later, I'm like, oh fuck, I should have seen that. But, but to me, seeing 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 physical sights is not travel. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, it's all the emotions, experiences, and everything else around the people you meet, and and that that's the travel bit. You know what's interesting? What's interesting is also that, well, back then travel was harder because of the lack of information, right? But yeah. now it kind of feels like because of the amount of information that you're given, it causes a fear of missing out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like you yeah. don't want to visit Paris without visiting the Eiffel Tower, you know, because yeah. you know that, oh, I have to go to this, 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 this. otherwise I That's wouldn't it. have traveled Paris, right? Tick, tick, so, tick, tick, tick. That's all it is. Yeah, so, that, that's what so it's really become. a balance of, of, of that as well. Yeah. And, and I also think that that's also one thing with tech that and the ability to access information at a fast pace, it pushes a human tolerance of timeline in traveling to be like a very fast paced thing. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like yeah. back then, you are willing to wait four days to see if your friend shows up in the meeting yeah. point that is like stated, you know, and you're willing to wait in the airport for stuff to happen or for yeah. flight delays. Nowadays, imagine a flight delay or anything, like people just yeah. get pissed off because you're like, oh yeah. shit, like now yeah. the itinerary is broken and then like everything is delayed and stuff yeah. like that. I think I think that I think what it is is uh in, in, a, in a sentence is um people are more obsessed with the FOMO of the that I have to, I have to have the tick than actually enjoying the experience. Hmm. Because enjoying the experience isn't necessarily tick, 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 see, I've done that. It could be you met a beggar on the street who you got talking to, who told you this amazing story about his life, and then you, and then that's the thing. That's, all my trips from South Amer- in South America and in, uh, in, in uh, Lebanese nuns trip, the things that are in my head, it's not the plane crash, it's not the gun battle in the West Bank, it's not the... Um, uh, you know, whatever else happened, I had, got, I had a gun put to my head twice, uh, once on Kosovo, once in Rwanda. Um, it's, it's, but it's not that. It's about, it's, the, it's just the people and the experiences, and that's what sticks with me. You know, and it's not looking at this as an amazing, um, you know, a building and stuff like that. And I think what's happened now is more people are like we, we have to show the world that we've ticked this box that you know we've been so far we've done splits you know, and, and it's like okay i mean if that's what people want that's great uh, it's not mm-hmm. what i would classify as travel but then travel a bit like sex and everything is it's a very subjective thing and people people have to take from it different things you know? so um but yeah but if i was to go traveling again Like if I was to go backpacking, I'd be, I mean, I'm a bit too old, I suppose now, but it would be interesting to see how I do it. Uh, I, I'd actually probably like to try and just leave my phone behind my camera behind home and just do it the old-fashioned way. 
But no one, no one that. will know that. Then you have to, you have to kind of block it so other people can see what you're doing. <laughs> hey, see, but but but, but it, it the person knows why it's here, and then I can, and then I can book about it, and then I can sell the book, and people can read. But people don't read anymore. They want pictures, yeah. I, yeah but, but that's it. But I, I, I'm not doing, I'm not doing travel to impress other people, and that's maybe another thing that's changed. I think people are like, oh, you know, here I, am, here we are, here we are, here we are. And I should look at us. We're we're traveling. And uh, all they're doing is like showing off that they've got money to go to places, basically. Yeah, actually hearing what you say, and I was reflecting a bit about like, because uh, I, I, I traveled with my parents a couple of years ago, and I've always been thinking about like bringing them. In fact, pre-COVID, that was the plan. But of course, COVID screwed everything up, and now we have to wait. But I've always realized that, because my parents are not super tax heavy, right? And, and for them, I think the concept of travel, and I, when I bring them around, it changes the way I travel as well because it's no longer about seeing things. Like, I think a lot of people have this issue whereby they go to a certain city and they feel like sitting in a cafe for a lot of time or for the whole day is a waste of time because then you are not seeing the city, you're just sitting in a cafe. But I actually realized that... Yeah, but I realized that if I brought my dad along, he would probably be really happy just sitting at a cafe, like feeling comfortable and watching the local life go by that would actually be amazing for him. And, and that is something I like to do myself. Like I always love to visit parks in cities because that is where you can just sit down, enjoy the nature. And then you look at what the locals are actually doing. And that helps to kind of rethink about like travel might not be about looking at places. It's really about you feeling happy about it through the journey and also experiencing things that you just want to experience. And that might not be what others terms and term as the highlights of a certain place. Yep. Yep. Okay. yep. So uh, I think I think pe- I think people watching is a, an amazing uh, travel experience. Actually, mm. yeah, that you definitely see a lot if you bother to sit down and try and eavesdrop on other people as well <laughs> on their conversations. Yeah. I think but, that's, but, a, that's but, but people don't anymore. You know, because <laughs> so, so so what's happening is uh, is you know the, the real experiences are happening all around you, and people are going. There's a building. Look at me. Shh. And they're not even sitting, they're not even looking down to see the place they're in. They're, it's just tick tick tick, you know. So which is which is if that's what they want, that's fine. I've got no problem with that. But, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a very interesting uh, insight, and I think I think. But like you say, uh, travel is very personal. So I also do understand the perception of others who are doing like you know the usual way yeah. of travel, and that's fine as well, right? So. So to conclude on this travel part, right, I definitely want to talk a bit, and I think you covered it on this a, a bit just now, is that within the nomadic community, there has always been this talk about like, when do you stop traveling? Or, you know, when do you feel like settling down? And what's the reason of settling down, yeah. right? And, and for you, you have mentioned a bit that it's mainly family. Um, but how have things changed? Like, like, what was the exact thought about like going from this crazy adrenaline-driven life uh, to something I mean... that's... It's funny because uh, you know people think, oh god, then he st- stop traveling. Do I miss? It? I, don't, I, don't, I don't miss it at all. I really don't miss it at all. Um, and for me, um, I mean, I guess the two big trips I've done that one in 1989. That was about me finding myself uh, at the age of 19. Um, and then, um, and then this one was obviously after the after the heavy truck driver. You know, that was a sort of a, a new start and so on. And I literally think I couldn't. I was getting tired of traveling after nine months. I had an amazing time, but it was time to finish. And I, I had to finish because I had a, had a, a deadline. But, um, and what I, what I found a lot when I was traveling uh, back then was that there were a lot of people on the road that weren't enjoying it anymore, but they were doing it because that's what they do. And they just keep on traveling and keep on. And, you know, I, I suspect... Um, you know, I mean, D- D- Dean's great because uh, he's done his 101 countries. And, and then, but you speak to him now, he's like, oh, man, I'm a bit tired. And I'm like, you can't be slowing down, man. You're the king. But, you know, <laughs> so, but I, I think, you know, can, can you do the digital nomad all around the world for life? Maybe you can. And maybe some people can. Um, I, I, I certainly couldn't for myself. Um, but, you know, everyone's different. Um, but I, I think... Uh, as a really important thing is that you need to have a bit of a purpose, I think, about whatever whatever it is you're doing. And if you just right, I've done 97 countries, now I've got three more to do. I need to go and tick, 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 you know. I mean, that's that's what people do, you know, and, and okay. But uh yeah, I don't know. 
Mm, okay, okay, and and it's because you you did ask the question about this. I found it very intriguing because when when we had the digital nomad panel, you were saying looking at our generation and seeing so many people just moving around, it does bring you back to certain memories. But you're also saying like, what what drives you to do it? And and I always feel like the whole real concept of digital nomadism yes is defined as you know remote workers that are able to work for anywhere and travel around the world but the underlying concept has always been a concept of freedom it's the yeah. concept of being able to stay if you want to stay and go if you want to go yeah. and not having to keep going and going even if you don't yeah, want it yeah yeah but, but I, I think i think people get lost within some people get lost within the concept and yeah. you know, and so and then that the and so it becomes harder to actually settle down uh, at some point later on because they just this is the lifestyle. Listen, I I, I think the whole digital nomad movement is an amazing thing, and uh, I can see massive change coming to Croatia in the next three to five, and positive change, you know. And um, I you know I follow you guys and, uh, and and all the cool guys we've met, the ambassadors, and they're here that and then they're meeting. They just happen to be in Spain, and there's six of them, and then oh, well, let's all go to Georgia for, and it's really cool. And I'm like, that is really good. But then at the same time, now that I live in Zagreb, now that Zagreb is becoming a really, really uh, cool you know, my destination, I know if I just stay where I am, all these friends are going to be at some point going to be coming through, and I, I can have that nomad experience hanging out with all these cool people from a static standpoint of, of Zagreb, because I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be living here and very connected to the nomad community here and more internationally as well. So um, I'm actually living my sort of um, my, my nomad lifestyle and, yeah. and, and also having a real life too. <laughs> yes, yes. Actually, that's, so this is actually a good point whereby I want to move towards some topic related to the special series on Croatia. And we yeah. are going to talk a bit about how the media actually changes or helps to push uh, a country's initiatives into like the digital nomad space. And I definitely want to talk a bit more about Chromats, which is a new initiative you are starting, and look into how nomadism can actually happen. Because we talk about a lot about really understanding the local culture and the local people, right? And that actually takes time. It's not like something that can be done like in yeah. a month even, right? So you are actually still living that travel life as I can see because you've been going around Croatia like crazy uh, in like your current status. So we might cut, for the listeners, we might cut this into the next episode. So okay. again, if you want to be updated when the episode release, uh, subscribe to the channel, and then we'll talk about it in the next episode.